Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining the fourth webinar in our series on the use of NAMS in risk assessment. This series is being co-organized by the US EPA, the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, and the PETA International Science Consortium. My name is Amy Klippinger. I direct the PETA International Science Consortium, and I'll be co-moderating today's webinar with Christy Sullivan, who is the Vice President of Research Policy at the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. So we have two speakers today who will be presenting on new approaches for fish toxicity testing. Dr. Michelle Embry from the Health and Environmental Sciences Institute, or HESI, and Dr. David Voles from the University of California, Riverside. Before I introduce our first speaker, I'd like to point out that the slides from today's webinar can be found online at the link that's currently on the screen, and a recording will be posted there as well shortly after this webinar. Slides and recordings of the first three webinars in this series are also available at the same link. There'll be time for a few clarifying questions after our first presentation, and then time for questions for both speakers at the end of the second presentation. Everyone is on mute, but you can type in any questions that you have in the questions section within your GoToWebinar toolbar, and then we'll read them out loud to the speakers. Um, so you can find this question pane in the um, toolbar that should be on the right-hand side of your screen. Speaking first today will be Dr. Michelle Embry. Michelle is Associate Director of Environmental Science at HESI, where she provides leadership, technical direction, and guidance to various collaborative committees on topics related to risk assessment and environmental protection. Prior to joining HESI in 2006, Michelle was an ecological risk assessor at the US EPA's Office of Pesticide Programs. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Michelle. Great, thank you, Amy and Christy, and appreciate everybody taking the time out of their busy day to join this webinar. As was mentioned, my slides are available online, and if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to send me an email. My contact information is at the uh, on the last slide. The one thing I'll also note is a lot of the things I'm going to talk about on the presentation today are provide, there's a lot of references provided in the last few slides, and those are a really good resource since there's a lot happening in this space, and I don't have a, a lot of time to talk today. So it's going to be a pretty high-level overview, but if you have any follow-up questions or um, would like to know more about any of the things I talk about today, please take a look at those slides at the end. So I'm going to be covering, as I mentioned already, just a broad brush stroke of the current alternative approaches for fish testing. Oops, here we go. And just a, a brief outline of what I'm going to cover today, because both uh, what my talk is going to be covering and also what Dave Vols will be covering um, touches on various projects within my organization, HESI. So I'll give you a little bit of background on HESI, some context of, of why we're working in this space, and then uh, as I already just mentioned, some NAMs or new approach methodologies for both fish acute talks and then also in other contexts as well. And then some ongoing work in future directions, including a discussion on validation and regulatory acceptance. So for those of you not familiar with HESI, we're the Health and Environmental Sciences Institute. We're a nonprofit based in Washington, DC. And our model is to bring together various sectors, academic and the research sector, government research and regulation, industry, R&D, and foundations and NGOs to work collaboratively on safety innovation for both human and environmental health. So under the umbrella of HESI, and if you'd like to know more, you're welcome to visit our website. Uh, the HESI Animal Alternatives and Environmental Risk Assessment Committee was formed in 2007, and this is a global collaborative committee, and the mission is to develop a sound technical basis, so we are very focused on the scientific issues for three R's, the reduction, refinement, or replacement, three R's based ecotox tests uh, on a global scale. 
a lot of what we did when we first were formed is to serve as a forum or a community of practice to bring the various stakeholders in this space, research, regulation, industry, together to talk about recent developments and also what the needs are. Um, and then to look across hazard assessment, effluent assessment, risk assessment, classification, labeling, and other regulatory needs in this space. So a lot of the focus, and it, uh, largely when this group was, was started about 12 years ago, a lot of the focus on animal alternatives or new approach methodologies, however you'd like to, to phrase it, was really focused on human health risk assessment. And I just wanted to show this slide to sort of underscore some of the differences that many of I'm sure you're, you're aware of, but just to highlight some of the challenges that we have in the ecological space that are very different than what we see with human health risk assessment. And this kind of gets at what our overall goal is. For human health, we're looking at one species. We are also, of course, looking at um, sensitive populations, so you have variations in that, but we're really looking at one species. Versus in ecological risk assessment, our goal is to really protect all taxa, and we have many more species that have to be covered there. We also, for human health, are generally more interested at the protection of the individual, whereas for ecological risk assessment, we're really trying to look at protection of a population. So endpoints are generally looking at growth, survival, and reproduction versus more specific understanding of specific effects or toxicity to target organs that we might see with human health. I think generally, and you'll see from some of what Dave is going to cover, we're, we're really moving towards more of a mechanistic basis in ecological space and human health, and the adverse outcome pathways are a really nice way to bridge ecological and human health. But I did want to put this up here because it is very important to consider these challenges, especially in light of developing alternative strategies. Uh, the other piece of it, too, is by looking at our protection target being so broad, looking at all species, all ecosystems. There's also a lot of compounds that lack data in the ecological space and are not very well studied. Um, generally, the resources for testing are more limited than for human health. Um, but even though we're looking at the ecological space, we do still have regulatory restrictions on the use of vertebrates. So general strategy for ecological risk assessment, and this is, is not a new slide by any means, is to kind of look at it in a tiered way where you start with tier one, where you might have just physical chemical property information um, or QSARs or other in silico types of methods, progress to tier two, which is kind of the non-vertebrate space or in vitro assays, and then move forward to refined in vivo tests and then your standard uh, test guideline type of in, in vivo tests. What we've really been moving towards is what you see in the Venn diagram on the right, which is more of an integrated way of looking at these different approaches together, so not necessarily in such a linear fashion. What I'm going to really be covering today is the kind of the tier one, tier two pieces of this. Um, of course, the three R's also deal with refinement of existing in vivo methods. I'm not really going to be covering that quite as much. I'm going to be focusing more on what we know um, in the kind of traditional tier one, tier two space. But again, I just wanted to also cover the fact that we, we have more of that Venn diagram, which is really the space we're operating in. So I'm just going to briefly touch on some motivations and background for alternatives in the eco space. I do, here's one of the references. Um, there's a couple here. Essie Talk in 20, 2003 published one of the first reports really kind of looking at a broad spectrum of the alternative needs in the eco space. And then there was a recent publication uh, in et and C that I would point you to, Adam Lillicrap is the first author, that gives a kind of a nice snapshot of the current work in this space. But just briefly, acute fish toxicity testing. So for those of you familiar with the OECD test guidelines, this would be test guideline 203 uh, or similar. It really is an integrated or integral part of most of the chemical management programs um, and also whole effluent toxicity testing or wet testing. And it's the most common endpoint required for eco tests. And this is just a little statistic, but more fish are used for a standard acute fish tox test than any other of the aquatic vertebrate assays. So, you know, even looking at the, uh, the chronic tests and, and the 
pictures down below or just talking, looking at kind of the, the relevance of the fish tests. Um, fish are more sensitive than in invertebrates only about 20% of the time. And this sort of gets at some of the discussions that you'll see later with, with some of the approaches to integrate invertebrate information into your, your strategy before determining next steps for fish or vertebrate tox testing. So what do we have in our toolbox? And this is really looking at the fish acute toxicity space. It's, it's kind of where I'm going to focus a bit more. And Dave is going to talk a little bit more about more of the chronic, longer term types of tests. So with that Venn diagram that I showed you before from the in silico space, there's quite a few QSARs already available out there um, for, for this space. Uh, we also have read across that's been employed, and one of the things I'll talk about uh, in a little bit more detail is the concept of the threshold of toxicological concern, which is lever leveraging existing information to try to answer questions for chemicals that, that are very data poor. We also, of course, have non-vertebrate tests, so we can, we can use prioritized or tiered approaches looking at algae testing and daphnia testing and therefore reducing the fish tests that are required. In vitro, we have cell-based assays that I'll talk about. Um, of course, in vivo, the threshold approach also reduces the number of in vivo tests needed. Um, by looking at uh, the lower of two concentrations, so not having to test as many concentrations. And then sort of in the middle here between in vivo and in vitro are the embryonic fish test or the fish embryo toxicity test or FET. So I'm gonna start out with one of those um, in silico types of approaches, just to give a little bit of background for those of you maybe not familiar with the threshold of toxicological concern. It was an approach that was really developed originally to look at low levels of contaminants, largely in food. And this is a graphic from um, Bobby Cruz's paper from 2004, when this approach was, was developed and this, this paper really nicely describes the, the concepts behind it. So what you see here um, on the x-axis is the NOEL values from chronic rodent studies. So this is all mammalian information. Um, and you see the, the, you see the the cumulative distributions of chemicals that are separated by Kramer classification, and that's what this class one, two, and three. This is a structural-based approach that identifies particular um, components of a chemical structure that might um, lead to higher or lower toxicity. So what you see are these distributions for different classes, and this is based on existing information for a very large number of chemicals. The concept here is that if you know your chemical is in one of these three classes or there have actually been additional classification schemes employed, that you can look at this lower fifth percentile or the, the 95th percentile that also has a 100-fold safety factor applied. And if your exposure concentration is below that value, you would have what we would call de minimis risk. So there's a very low probability that you would have um, toxicity that was lower or higher toxicity, lower value than that number. As I mentioned already, it was originally applied to assess chemicals in um, food contact materials, flavorings, impurities, and it's actually been used in the regulatory context for various human health endpoints for decades now. So one of the questions that we had within this HESI committee is, could we apply this in the ecological space? And this is largely leveraging existing information that we already have from traditional in vivo studies to make determinations for chemicals that we don't have any information on. So this committee developed a project that was looking at the eco-TTC or eco ecological threshold of toxicological concern. And we built a platform. This is freely available. It was actually uh, went live about a year ago at the SeaTac North America meeting in Sacramento. The URL is there. What we did in order to create those, um, those distributions that Human Health Group had pulled together a large curated database of rodent NOEL values. So what we did was something similar, but for the aquatic toxicity space pulling together algae and invertebrate and fish information, so aquatic tox only, for the traditional endpoints used to derive predicted no-effect concentrations, or PNEX. 
The database has around 91,000 curated aquatic toxicity records. Those were drawn from existing databases. So we didn't go directly to the peer reviewed literature. We drew from largely Ecotox and other databases, a little bit from the REACH data as well to create this database. It's very user friendly. We would be happy if any of you are interested to do a, a quick demo with, a, with some of you through a, a follow up webinar if needed. And what this has is not only the database, but are also several freely available analysis tools that allow you to calculate PNEX for your filtered data set. It also then allows you to create those eco TTC distributions based on attributes chosen by the user. And then we also have the chemical toxicity distribution tool, which I'll talk about in a second. And this was all developed um, via a global collaborative partnership between government, academia, and industry, and it's managed and um, financial costs are covered by HESI. So just to go into this a little bit, the idea behind the EcoTTC is that you would obtain your toxicity, existing toxicity data for multiple chemicals in the class that you define as the user. So for human health, this is the Kramer classification schemes. For us in Ecotox, it might be the Verhar mode of action classification, it might be Ecosar class, it might be PhysChem properties, for example. So you identify the class um, of chemicals that you're using to create your grouping. You would determine your um, chemical specific PNEX and apply the appropriate application factors depending on the data that are available and the, the geographic location that you are in. And then you would plot those distribution the plot the distribution of those PNEX and look at the lowest fifth percentile value. And that is what your eco TTC is. Um, and so what you can see here in this screenshot is the PNEX that are derived and the application factors that are applied to those PNEX. What I just wanted to underscore with this is that the EcoTTC is extremely conservative because it's looking at a distribution of PNEX, which have various um, uncertainty factors applied, um, thereby making it relatively conservative. So the database, as you search, you can, as I mentioned already, you can go and look by various classification schemes to create your grouping here. And what it will do is, is give you a downloadable Excel file of the chemicals that meet those search and filter criteria that you as the user define. So the idea here then is you can derive your PNEX and look at your eco TTC distribution. And the output's gonna look like this, where you have the concentration on your X axis and the probability on the Y. And what you see here is these little gray points are the individual PNEX for all the chemicals in your group. And what you have here is that lower fifth percentile PNEC, which would in essence for this example be your eco TTC value. So if you had a concentration of your unknown chemical that fell in this group that was below 2.21 times 10 to the negative seventh milligrams per liter, then the idea here is that you would probably have de minimis risk and would maybe not be high priority for further testing. As I already mentioned, those PNEX are very conservative. They have application factors applied to them. We had a workshop a couple years ago up in Ottawa that was um, uh, co-hosted by Environment and Climate Change Canada. At that meeting, we talked about the need to just look at what the toxicity values would look like as a distribution without the application factors. So lower degree of um, uncertainty or conservatism. And the tool will also allow you to look at this. And this isn't the same example, but it's a similar type of distribution that you see, but this isn't based on the PNEX, it's actually based on the actual values from your, uh, your study. So it might be your acute LC50 or your chronic value, et cetera. So the way that the, the flow of this works is you do a search filter, you identify your target data set, and you determine as the user whether you want to look at the EcoTTC, which uses application factors, or your chemical toxicity distribution, which does not include application factors. So the idea there is um, if you come up with a framework for the EcoTTC, can you use this once you've identified your exposure assessment um, to make a preliminary determination um, of whether or not you have a concern and where you might go forward with additional testing. And this is modified from a paper from 2005. And we're, as a group, working through various case studies to determine where the ECO-TTC fits within this framework. And um, 
borrowing this from my boss, but the idea with any framework is they're a bit like toothbrushes. Everyone has one. Not everyone wants to use anybody else's, but what we're doing within this group is hoping to develop a suitable framework that can be applicable across very um, various uh, domains of application. So that's sort of the in silico piece that this committee has been working on. I'm going to pivot now to some in vitro work, and this isn't under the auspices of this committee, but we work really closely with Christine Shermer, who's at AVAG in Switzerland. She's been um, very involved and instrumental in moving the RT-GIL W1 assay forward. RT-GIL W1 is a rainbow trout gill cell line, and it's been investigated as a um, surrogate for the acute test. I know there's also ongoing work expanding that as well. The one thing I'd like to highlight is it's a recently adopted ISO guideline and there um, we're hoping and it's been um, approved I think within OECD to be taken on in their work plan um, uh, and hopefully will be, uh, it was proposed just um, I guess last year and will be taken on in their work plan to develop a t an OECD test guideline. So there's various references here. Um, the cells are available from ATCC, and the assumption is that for fish acute toxicity, gill is the primary site of interaction with many of these chemicals, and the cells are evaluated looking for mortality with a combination of different cell viability dyes that are listed there. So it's a very well-developed, optimized, and widely used standard operating pro, uh, procedure or protocol. It's been evaluated for transfer, transferability across labs and robustness through a ring trial. And this Fisher et al. 2019 paper provides the uh, summary of the ring trial that was evaluated in various labs. And you can just see here, DCA is sort of the positive control um, there's various chemicals that have been evaluated both for inter and intra-laboratory variability. So it's a very robust method um, and the details are provided here. I think importantly for this particular method is that it's been used for chemicals, mixtures, effluents, and various extracts. Um, and what we've seen here through various publications, there's on the right is a recent paper that was looking at fragrances. We're also looking at a couple others on the left um, that have really looked at comparing the EC50 in the cells versus the in vivo assays. And these are actually switched here, fishes on the X versus fishes on the Y. But what you can see is it it actually performs very well. There's a few chemicals, oops, there's a few chemicals where, where we see the fish are more sensitive. The groups have looked at those and many of them are due to very specific modes of action or um, activation through, through metabolism um, and those are being explored in additional detail. The fish embryo toxicity assay is another one, it was adopted as an OECD test guideline in 2016. And really um, the basics of that method are is it's, it's looking at newly fertilized embryos um, and comes up with an LC50 calculation, calculation at 48 and 96 hours um, using four different endpoints for acute lethality. Uh, and this is just a summary that kind of shows you the development of the zebrafish uh, embryo and provides um, pictures of some of the lethal effects that are looked at in the test. There's been quite a bit of work in this space related to comparison of the acute fish test, so the OECD 203 and the fish embryo test. I don't have time to get into all of this. There's certain chemicals for which it doesn't seem to be maybe quite as sensitive. Those are in many cases, chemicals with very specific modes of action. Um, the question really is in this red down here, when is it a big deal and when is it not? And what differences that you see between the fish embryo test and the acute fish test um, really are gonna make a difference um, in the end. And there's a lot of work happening on this space, some, some hopefully some new funding that'll be coming through in this space. So um, I would just encourage you to kind of watch, watch this space a bit more. I do think it's very important to consider the mode of action impact and what we have seen, a recent analysis um, on this slide that Scott Glaberman did and Marta Sabanska did some follow-up work looking at for neurotoxic compounds that fish seem to be, um, embryos seem to be somewhat less sensitive than juvenile fish. And a lot of this analysis can be seen in this graph over here looking at compounds for which we have very specific information on mode of action. 
The thing I would like to bring in that kind of brings together the fish embryo test work as well as the TTC work is what we can see from looking at existing information um, for specific modes of action um, that what we see is in the case of neurotoxicants um, that Daphnia are the most sensitive uh, species, algae aren't very well studied, and the fish are actually pretty invariable across um, across the, across what we see there. So I think what I wanted to kind of demonstrate with this slide really is that even in cases where you might have a difference between an alternative for fish acute, it's also important to look at sensitivity across different trophic levels. And that sort of brings me um, to my next point, which is the threshold approach, which is another alternative that's been put forward. There's actually some OECD guidance on this particular approach. The concept here, again, much like the ECOTTC, is it's leveraging all existing uh, information. It's looking at acute tox information for both algae, daphnia, and fish. And what we see in the ECOTTC and the Envirotox database and with various analyses that have been conducted, that 80% of the time, algae and daphnids are more sensitive than fish. So can we use that information to reduce fish testing? And the concept here is that you would conduct your algae and daphnia tests first, and then take the lower of those values. So for the algae, you would do a 72-hour test. For the Daphnia, you would do a 48-hour test. You would take the lower of those concentrations and do a single concentration acute fish test. And that would reduce the need to test at multiple concentrations in the fish test. So taking this a little bit further than it has been, one of the questions is, could we replace even this sin single concentration acute fish test with our uh, fish embryo test that I already covered or the RTGW1, um, the, the cell line test? So that's just something to consider going forward um, when we think about NAMs to also think about not just a one-to-one -one replacement, but how might they fit into that Venn diagram of looking across taxa, across trophic levels. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit from a few acute fish toxicity testing to just briefly touch on two other areas that I think are really important when we think about alternatives for fish testing. So bioaccumulation testing is another area that um, through various regulatory paradigms has required quite a bit of testing. Um, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about this, but what we know is that um, we have our three oak OECD 305 test guideline, which is our standard in vivo test. But in absence of running that test, what we've been using for bioaccumulation uh, estimation for years are some of the mathematical models that are largely based on KOW relationships. Um, and this does not account for the fact that many compounds might be metabolized, um, which can tend to reduce bioaccumulation. And through various papers and a lot of, a lot of really hard work, um, it's really been identified that metabolism is really one of the most critical pieces of uncertainty in bioaccumulation um, estimates, uh, where you go and you might use KOW-based predictions, you come up with a bioaccumulation estimate, and what we find is oftentimes those estimates might overestimate the, overestimate the potential for a chemical to bioaccumulate. And what that might end up doing is pushing people to run an in vivo test when they might be able to um, refine their estimate, not have to run a full in vivo test, but get a more accurate um, estimate of the bioaccumulation potential of their chemical. So this is actually through another HESI committee um, and various stakeholders that have been working for years on this. Uh, there's a method to look in vitro using rainbow trout liver S9 subcellular fractions or cryopreserved hepatocytes to look at loss of parent over time. So an in vitro method to get a handle on your first order kinetics, your loss through metabolism, extrapolate that in vitro information to get an in, a refined in vivo BCF prediction um, that can allow you to, again, like, like I mentioned, potentially get a more refined BCF estimate and maybe not have to run an in vivo study. So this method was actually in 2018 accepted as two new test guidelines within OECD. They're test guidelines 319 A and B. Um, I think they might actually be quite useful um, in other contexts outside of bioaccumulation specifically. They're really aimed to look at metabolism in fish, um, specifically in rainbow trout. 
and I would just encourage you to take a look at those a bit more when you're looking at alternatives to fish testing um, because they're a really nice in vitro way to get at metabolism of a test chemical. The last area I'm just going to briefly touch on is an effluent assessment. And I think it's often, um, maybe not because it's in a little bit of a different paradigm, it's not um, specifically something where you would, would evaluate in a chemical by chemical basis, but effluent assessment is a common tool to look at aquatic environmental protection. It requires the use of fish, both for acute and chronic tests. And effluents are variable and therefore testing is required recurrently. So it's not sort of you run your test, you get your answer and you're done. There's testing that's required in some cases on a weekly basis. It's been estimated that three to six million fish are used annually in the US alone. And this led for the HESI Animal Alternatives Committee to have a workshop that resulted in this paper below, Teresa Norberg King is the first author, to identify what alternatives are available, what's in our toolbox to evaluate effluent assessment. And there's several promising alternatives, some of which I covered here, which are in red. The RT-GIL W1 has been used and evaluated for effluents, as has the fish embryo test. And there's several other assays here, many of which look at um, non-vertebrate species, so algae, bacteria, and invertebrates. And there's ongoing work within this committee to evaluate uh, some of these promising alternatives to see how they may be applied um, for effluent assessment. So the last thing I'm going to just touch on is regulatory acceptance. So NAMs often do challenge the status quo, what we're comfortable with. Change is often hard. And we need new expertise and skills in order to evaluate those NAMs and figure out where they should be placed. And I think thinking about this rather than from a one-to-one -one replacement, but how do they fit in an integrated um, testing strategy? How can they be fit for purpose is extremely important. Um, Change is difficult, like I already mentioned. We do have mutual acceptance of data within OECD member countries, but this doesn't necessarily mean that that facilitates implementation, and that has to occur at the federal level. The validation of any method um, and method validation bodies across the globe have different strategies and interests, so how might we tackle this? Um, I think there's been a lot of progress on specific guidance on how NAMs could be implemented, and this does apply also to fish testing. We need participation by government groups in the various validation programs, and all of the projects I touched upon today have had that involvement from the very beginning. Um, and one of the things in bold there, and this I think we saw with Envirotox, is we desperately need really good, robust databases to facilitate the comparisons the interpretations, and also some of the read across or QSAR methods to really begin moving some of these forward. So this last slide just talks about some next steps related to the ongoing things I talked about. Um, there's ongoing work on OECD Project 2.54, looking at IATAs for fish acute testing. So those of you interested in getting involved in that or work with OECD, that's something to watch. The HESI committee, um, I already kind of covered what we're interested in. If you'd like to know more, please let me know. We'd love to have more stakeholders involved. And the bioaccumulation committee, I sort of covered um, what that group has been up to. We're also looking very closely at bird and invertebrate biotransformation as well and how that might fit into the um, risk assessment scheme. And um, the OECD test guideline for the RT-GIL W1, we're hoping we'll, we'll move forward with an OECD um, hopefully soon. So I've already kind of covered most of this already, so I'm not going to repeat myself. And I will just end here with this slide um, to let you know if you're interested in getting involved in this. There's the HESI committees in this space, but I also wanted to put a plug in for the CTAC Animal Alternatives and ERA Interest Group. We had a meeting just last week at the CTAC North America meeting in Toronto. We also have meetings in Europe, and the CTAC Europe meeting is happening in Dublin, Ireland. In May of 2020, and there is a session on alternative approaches for EcoTox, and the link is there. Um, and abstracts are due November 27th. So if you work in this space and you're interested in being part of the session, um, please plan to submit your abstract there. With that, I will end. Um, my email is here, and as I already mentioned, um, I'm not going to go through these, but there's a whole uh, slew of references that you can take a look at. Um, to get more information, and I'd just like to thank the people who helped with this slide deck, and thank you for your attention. Well, thanks very much.
much, Michelle. Um, that was a quite informative talk and a good overview of um, all the activities that are going on in this area. Um, this is Christy Sullivan, Amy's co-host, and we are going to allow just a few minutes for any clarifying questions. Um, again, we'll have a longer period of time for discussion at the uh, at the end, but I wanted to provide an opportunity just for clarifying questions for Michelle's presentation. Um, okay, so I'm going to ask, I think this is really interesting, I want to get your perspective. What, how do you combine the test with a rainbow trout cell line with OECD guidance 23 on testing of difficult chemicals? I don't know that that's um, been done yet. I think one of the things that they're trying to do specifically with that assay is to make is to try to test it with a broader suite of chemicals. So I don't know that it's actually been specifically highlighted in OECD 23. But what I would suggest, I don't I don't have a specific answer for you. But um, Christine Shermer, who's the one really working on that methodology and has been looking at how it can be applied in the case of effluents, um, or in my my guess is in in chemicals for which you might have some analytical issues or solubility issues, um, she would be the best person to probably provide additional feedback on that. And thanks for that answer. I think that's a really good place to highlight the need for further work. Even, even though OECD has just revised that guidance document, um, maybe time to take a look at it again with some of the in vitro aquatic uh, work uh, guidelines coming out. Yeah, and I'm not totally Thanks sure um, there, I don't know if there's someone else on the phone um, who knows more, but I'm not entirely sure how much of the NAMs are integrated into that document or if it's more from the traditional tests perspective. I think it's, um, yeah, it's more from the, from the traditional test perspective mm -hmm. at this point. Um, but it's an important point related to in vitro assays, embryo assays, any new methods to um, to think about those issues that we have with difficult to test substances or you know other factors that kind of are your outside of your normal domain of what you would be testing to try to evaluate those limits for some of these tests. It's very important. Great. Well, uh, we have a couple more questions coming in, but I'm going to save them until the till after Dr. Bowles' presentation. So we have a lots of time for both. And so let me now introduce the next presenter. Thanks again, Michelle. Um, speaking next will be Dr. David Bowles. Dave is an associate professor with the Department of Environmental Sciences at the University of California, Riverside, where his research focuses on the use of zebrafish embryos and human cell models. Prior to joining UC Riverside, Dr. Voles worked as a toxicologist within the product safety and R&D division of Syngenta and as an assistant professor within the Department of Environmental Health Sciences at the University of South Carolina, Columbia. So um, take it away, Dr. Voles. Hey, thanks so much. And thank you, everybody, for uh, taking time out of your busy day to join this web uh, webinar series. So what I'm going to be um, talking about today is a project uh, that was led by uh, HESI, in particular, uh, Michelle, um, about 10 years ago that was focused on trying to explore alternatives to the fish early life stage test. And um, so what I'm going to be doing is kind of walking through a couple different workshops that were sponsored initially by HESI and then um, highlight some of the conclusions coming out of the, both of those workshops that were uh, published in a couple different papers. And then, uh, and then also talking about um, how this ultimately led to a couple different uh, research um, or requests for proposals, uh, both in Europe and the United States within the US EPA, uh, to help kind of move, uh, uh, move this forward a little bit more. And so I first want to acknowledge um, Hesse and in particular Michelle and her committee that's focused on animal alternatives and, and environmental risk assessment that she talked about in her talk. Um, I also want to acknowledge everyone that was involved in uh, both of the workshops. 
uh, that occurred, and uh, the first one was in 2010 at Santa Fe Aventis in Paris, uh, and then the second follow-up workshop that we had that was specifically focused on uh, the fish oily life stage test was held at the US EPA lab in Duluth, Minnesota, and that was in May of 2012. Um, as Michelle mentioned, HESI is a really uh, unique organization in that um, they try to draw uh, a, a variety of experts and scientists from uh, many different sectors um, and uh, all over the world. And so it was really a unique opportunity, I think, to bring uh, a bunch of you know, smart people to the table that had different perspectives to really try to move the needle uh, a bit further uh, with respect to this particular issue. And so what I'm going to do is first start out with um, uh, focusing on the fish oily life stage test and why we sort of zeroed in on this particular guideline uh, as a uh, potential need for a, an alternative strategy. And then I'll uh, highlight some of the uh, what the focus and the output was of both workshops in uh, 2010 and 2012, and how this led to uh, sort of the development of a research strategy for uh, FELS-specific AOP development, and, and in turn, how this led to a couple different RFPs that were released in uh, Europe uh, and the United States. And so if we first start with the uh, full life cycle test. What I'm showing you in this slide is a um, uh, kind of the typical sort of process or method that you would find within a fathead minnow full, uh, full life cycle test. So this is, a, this is a pretty expensive test, at least based on our estimates 10 years ago. Uh, the typical CRO cost would be, you know, over 350K. Uh, that's probably pushing more like half a million dollars these days. The study duration is about five to six months because you're essentially taking, doing a uh, continuous exposure to a single chemical from uh, fertilization all the way out into adulthood at about 140 days if it's a uh, fathead minnow test. And so it's a pretty labor intensive, uh, very long test, uh, uses quite a bit of animals and is pretty expensive. And so, actually, the Fish Early Life Stage test, uh, or the FELS test, was introduced uh, over 30 years ago as an alternative to the uh, Fish Full Life Cycle uh, test uh, because of the uh, cost, uh, uh, elevated cost, et cetera. And so, this was kind of introduced as a basically an alternative to help streamline um, testing of chemicals, primarily uh, pesticides. And this developed into a OECD test guideline uh, 210 uh, or the OS OCSPP guideline 850-1400. And so this has been used uh, and it's been the primary guideline test for estimating fish chronic toxicity for many years, for a few decades. And it's frequently used to support uh, environmental risk assessments as well as chemical management programs around the world. So the uh, three most commonly used species for this test uh, on the freshwater side are fathead minnows, which are a small fish model, uh, as well as rainbow trout. Rainbow trout used to be used quite a bit uh, within the, uh, as a species for the fish early life stage test, but became uh, less frequently used mainly because, again, because of the size of the rainbow trout and the uh, space needs, et cetera, uh, and the volume of contaminated waste, it was, it was essentially phased out, more or less, uh, as the uh, primary species for the FELS test, and the fathead minnow pretty much replaced a lot of the testing that was done, um, you know, for the fish early life stage test on the freshwater side. For saltwater fish, the sheep's head minnow is the most commonly used uh, uh, fish. It's not as large as a rainbow trout, but not as small as a fathead minnow. So, so we, when we were initially discussing um, kind of where to focus our efforts uh, within uh, Michelle's committee, I, I distinctly remember, you know, us kind of batting this around quite a bit over, over multiple conference calls, and we eventually landed on the fish early life stage test as, as a way to help the committee uh, focus on something that we could sort of sink our teeth into. And the reason we did this was... Um, because uh, even though the fish oily life stage test was introduced as an alternative to the full life cycle test, 
it's still pretty labor and resource intensive. Um, the study duration is about one to three months, depending on what species you use. It requires at least 360 fish, but usually more than uh, 700 fish after you account for range finding studies, et cetera. And the typical CRO cost, at least based on estimates from a decade ago, uh, we're pushing $125,000 U.S. dollars, and that's probably, again, accounting for inflation, probably above 150k these days. And so this was a because the FVLS test was uh, so widely used to support uh, ecological risk assessments, and because it was pretty labor and resource intensive, um, uh, we decided to kind of zero in on this uh, particular test as a, uh, a, a as a way to help focus the committee and identify <clears throat> potential alternative strategies. In addition, uh, if you start looking at kind of the details of the guideline and look at what endpoints, test endpoints, are captured within this test, uh, what we qu quickly realized as a committee is that the endpoints such as survival, percent hatch, body length, et cetera, these sort of gross morphologic endpoints that are collected within an FELS test provide little uh, information about the mode of action of a uh, particular or the mechanism of action of a particular compound. And so it, it, it wasn't pr particularly helpful uh, based on those endpoints and based on the, um, the NOx and the EC10s that are developed for categorizing chemicals by mode of action. You basically just don't have the sort of resolution you need um, based on the endpoints that are collected in order to, to begin binning chemicals by uh, mode of action, which was a goal for, um, for this particular effort. And so we uh, sort of turned to uh, adverse uh, outcome pathways as a way to help sort of conceptualize and uh, identify potential research strategies and so uh, we had these discussions within this committee right about the same time uh, and a little bit before the uh, Ankley et al. paper, 2010 paper, came out of the Duluth lab that sort of um, basically laid out this adverse outcome pathway concept. And I was also happened to be involved in a SeaTac Pelston workshop in 2007 that was um, uh, organized by Dan Villeneuve at the US EPA in Duluth as well as uh, uh, Natalia Garcia uh, Riero, who's at the U.S. Army Lab in Vicksburg. And, uh, and one of the outputs of that particular workshop was a paper that um, John Nichols, who's also at the EPA Lab in Duluth, was the lead author on that I was involved in as well. And we sort of outlined um, what would happen conceptually with respect to uh, uh, not only changing or altering the trajectory of, a, of the health of an organism or the development of an organism, but also trying to capture um, you know, the potential for adaptive responses. And so this, uh, this is particularly important in the context of fish early life stage development or any development of, uh, of an organism because it's a very dynamic, unlike sort of an adult animal, it's a very dynamic process that's rapidly changing, particularly in fish embryos. And depending on the timing of exposure and depending on whether, you, whether you're hitting a particular sensitive window at a specific concentration, it may or may not uh, alter the normal trajectory of development. And so we wanted to sort of capture and think about these processes in the, con in the context of adverse outcome pathways, but also in the context of uh, the potential for adaptive uh, responses during development. And so the first workshop was in 2010, and, and as I mentioned, this was a HESI-sponsored workshop uh, that was held at Santa Fe Aventis in Paris. And uh, this was sort of a broader workshop, but the first uh, and the overall objective of the wor workshop was to identify research gaps and strategies related to the development of alternatives for both chronic fish and amphibian toxicity testing. And the first half of the workshop was focused on the FELS test, whereas the second half was focused on amphibians. And essentially what we kind of zeroed in on and discussed within the first half of the workshop, which is relevant to today's uh, discussion, is that we uh, first explored potential alternatives to a representative uh, commonly used chronic long-term ecotoxicity test, the FELS test, and we sort of divided out uh, the first half of the workshop into two different sessions. One focused on 
uh, asking the question of what's the current data availability of the FELS test, and as well as what are the um, you know endpoints that are evaluated within this test, and then how can we use FELS specific AOPs to identify potential assays for an alternative tier testing strategy. And so this led to a, uh, a forum uh, paper within TOXI in, in uh, 2011 that, um, that I took the lead on, but there are a number of authors that uh, contributed uh, significantly to this paper. And this forum paper is basically a, uh, a special kind of um, uh, uh, paper within TOXI that you can report out basically workshop uh, results and workshop recommendations. And so we utilize this sort of mechanism as a way to communicate out what our key findings and recommendations were from the 2010 workshop. And this was published in 2011. And so the first thing that um, we sort of talk about uh, within, <clears throat> within this paper is that we wanted to uh, further provide a little more meat around uh, the bones here. And so we ended up uh, focusing on three different case studies or three different reference chemicals that have been well studied uh, within early life stages of fish. And we wanted to sort of test conceptually this concept or idea that we may be able to use um, sort of lower tier non-animal based assays as a way to potentially predict um, what may be happening not only at the organism level within an early life stage of uh, fish, but also possibly predicting um, you know, what would happen in terms of the adult fish if we alter the normal trajectory of development. And so we uh, selected um, 2378-TCDD uh, or dioxin, <clears throat> which is well known to induce uh, cardiotoxicity within early life stages of fish by blocking, essentially blocking normal cardiac looping. Uh, we also looked at chlorpyrifos oxone, which is a potent metabolite of uh, chlorpyrifos that inhibits um, acetylcholinesterase and results in an elevated uh, acetylcholine-induced um, um, triggering. And, uh, and this has also been well studied, uh, not only in mammalian models, but also in fish models in terms of the ability to induce neurotoxicity. And then the last one we looked at was um, linear alkyl benzene sulfonate. Uh, which is found in a lot of detergents and uh, household products. And this has also been uh, well studied within early life stages of fish and is known to induce uh, gill toxicity uh, within, within fish. And so if we start at the top and look at the first case study, uh, what we did was basically uh, try to develop a figure that captured um, data that are available within uh, peer-reviewed literature that's specific to early life stages of fish. And so for TCDD, we know that TCDD is a potent uh, agonist of the aerohydrocarbon uh, receptor within fish, similar to mammals. And this can lead to alterations in the abundance of cardiomyocytes, which in turn leads to heart malformations and cardiovascular dysfunction. And this at ultimately leads to uh, hypoxia within the embryo and decreased growth and fertility. And so the idea here is that maybe if we could identify assays that capture uh, sort of key events that are occurring toward the left-hand side of this AOP, such as HR activation, a, uh, a fish-specific cardiomyocyte assay, or even a, a mammalian ca cardiomyocyte uh, in vitro assay, and possibly even zebrafish embryos, um, you know, that uh, are within these sort of early stages, early non-protected stages, we might be able to then predict if we had quantitative uh, dose response curves, be able to predict what would happen at later stages of development. Similarly, if we look at chlorpyrifos oxon, uh, again, based on the peer-reviewed uh, literature, we know that um, chlorpyrifos oxon can decrease uh, the growth of axons uh, primary and secondary motor neurons within developing uh, fish embryos, and this leads to disrupted uh, neuronal cell signaling, uh, nervous system disruption, and uh, locomotor activity. And then finally with uh, LAS, this is uh, well established as a uh, sort of narcotic uh, compound that disrupts, it's sort of nonspecific MOA, but it disrupts cell membrane binding, which then leads to alterations in ion homeostasis, 
disruption of gill morphology, and so on. And so we wanted to use these sort of three uh, case studies by which were by no means comprehensive, but again, allowed us to, to focus as a committee on a few compounds that have been well studied uh, within the literature. And then, then we sort of moved to, okay, well, if we were to identify alternative uh, assays, how would this look within a tier testing strategy? And this is what we came up with as a group. In the first tier, uh, we would have in vitro based assays that would represent uh, some of these sort of key events or uh, initiating events or, or uh, uh, basically molecular level sort of targets that uh, could be impacted by a, a wide variety of uh, compounds. And so if we look at tier one, tier 1.1 is meant to reflect, uh, for example, AHR specific reporter assays that would allow you to identify AHR agonists. Uh, and maybe you have axonal growth assays that are again in vitro, gill cell uh, viability assays, such as uh, the one that uh, Michelle talked about. But we also recognize as a committee that obviously these are not comprehensive and that there would need to be an additional sort of battery of in vitro assays, which is shown as tier 1.N, uh, in order to accurately reflect the potential sort of uh, t high priority targets uh, for a, a wide variety of chemicals that are you know, relevant to FELS. So these would be high throughput. Uh, you could screen hundreds to thousands of compounds and you could use this as a way to potentially prioritize which compounds you would take into, for example, the fish embryo toxicity tests, such as the FET test that Michelle talked about. And then based on the hits that you uh, receive out of tier two, you could then prioritize those into this standard guideline test, the OECD uh, 210 test, as a way to um, essentially confirm uh, that the, a positive hit uh, is, is indeed um, still uh, toxic under more physiologically relevant uh, longer-term studies. And so we ended up then um, having a follow-up workshop in 2012 that was uh, held in at the US EPA lab in Duluth. And, uh, and the reason we did that uh, was that one of the key conclusions from our TOXI paper in 2011 was that the initial teening, uh, screening tier uh, uh, tier one must be expanded to a broad range or battery of toxicologically relevant AOPs. And so we ended up having an entire workshop in Duluth. There was about, I think around 50 people or so that uh, participated from all over the world uh, that was focused specifically on FELS AOPs. And the primary objective of this workshop was to identify and discuss the scope and breadth of potential AOPs during early fish development and our expected outcome uh, from this workshop was that we would provide the first sort of critical step for development of an alternative testing strategy for the FELS test by, by getting, trying to get a handle on how, how many sort of AOPs are we talking about, what is the scope and breadth of potential AOPs that are relevant to FELS. And so this, uh, the, the results, uh, excuse me, the findings and recommendations from th this particular workshop were published in ETNC in 2014, and Dan Villeneuve and I took the lead on this. He was the lead author on this paper. Um, and this paper ends up, uh, ended up basically describing, uh, basically a strategy for discovering and annotating adverse outcome pathways for early fish development. And this was a direct result of the discussions and uh, key sort of research recommendations from the 2012 workshop. And basically what we uh, ended up uh, developing was this sort of six step strategy for FELS AOP development, where first you kind of start off with almost like a problem formulation where you're defining the scope and what and the purpose of the FELS AOP effort. And then we quickly realized that within step two, we would need to uh, understand what's normal in terms of fish early life stage development. What are some of the key events that occur? Uh, what are some of the key developmental landmarks that occur during early fish development? And when, and when do these occur? And so that was step two. And then step three 
after you have a sort of roadmap of what's normal, then you need to prioritize which FELS AOP should be developed based on which AOPs you would expect to have long-term effects uh, later in development, even into adulthood. And then step four involves uh, constructing high priority FELA, uh, excuse me, FELS AOPs using existing data, and then moving into identifying and filling gaps with additional testing and data, uh, which can then be fed back into steps two and four, depending on what data you collect. And then finally, evaluating and cataloging these AOPs in a knowledge base, such as the um, uh, AOP wiki. And so if we look at um, the, uh, uh, this idea of building a conceptual model, uh, this is a figure I pulled together for this paper that's specific to zebrafish embryogenesis, largely because that's where a lot of information is known in the literature about uh, normal embryonic development uh, in the zebrafish model. This has been studied for many years. Um, and so as you can see, even based on sort of a, uh, honestly, a, cur a cursory kind of review of zebrafish embryonic development, um, it becomes rapidly becomes very complicated in terms of the various developmental landmarks that you see uh, even within the first 48 hours of uh, embryonic development. And so our thinking around this, this was by no means comprehensive, but was sort of a preliminary uh, uh, effort on this. But basically, if we wanted to move this conceptual model forward, we would need to expand out the developmental landmarks and really get a good sort of picture of, uh, of how the embryo changes over time and what are some of the key events that could be disrupted by a, a contaminant, because then that's going to allow you to identify uh, potential assays that could reflect those key biological events and help you develop a battery of assays within that sort of tier one level of uh, screening. And so we ended up uh, also discussing a couple different criteria for identifying a quote-unquote key event. And what I'm showing you is uh, an example uh, within FISH that's specific to cardiac looping. So the first criterion is that it needs to be observable and measurable. And this is uh, because FISH embryos develop ex utero and they're transparent. This is a very uh, cardiac looping or disruption of cardiac looping is, is very easy to measure within embryos. And, uh, and, and this is the primary sort of readout or, or, or effect that TCDD has on early life stages of embryos. The second criterion is that it's required for normal growth and uh, survival. And so by meeting those two sort of cr criteria, uh, we uh, would use this then as a way to identify what's sort of a key event and important for later long-term stages of development because our primary purpose here is to identify and deploy assays that would be able to predict later stages of development. So we then kind of moved into, this is a figure that uh, Dan Villeneuve pulled together that sort of lays out how we would prioritize the FELS AOPs. We'd start off with the first question, which is uh, asking, is the adverse outcome directly observable? within a, a FISH embryo toxicity test, such as uh, the OECD uh, test guideline 236 that Michelle talked about. And if it is, then we could possibly screen it, screen that compound with the optimized uh, FET test where we add in some additional non-lethal endpoints using high content screening or whatever. But this would be a low priority for uh, AOP uh, development because these are sort of these adverse apical outcomes that you would measure on kind of the right-hand side of the adverse outcome pathway. If you don't directly observe uh, the adverse outcome pathway within the FET test, then that would lead to asking the question of whether the key event is directly observable within the FET test. And if yes, then you could also screen that sort of tier two screen uh, using an optimized FET test, say with zebrafish embryos, but this would also be a high priority for AOP development uh, because you'd be able to link, potentially link the observable key event to some sort of adverse outcome uh, later in development. And then finally, if it was not observable, if the key event wasn't observable within the FET test, then this would lead to um, uh, uh, potential screening with HTS in vitro 
And this would also be a high priority for AOP development because we would want to ultimately link in vitro key events to adverse outcomes. So the fourth step involved uh, constructing FELS AOPs using existing data. And I'm just pulling basically a portion of the figure that I've already shown you for FELS, the FELS AOP for AHR activation. So you can imagine that you, you would do this for uh, a lot of different sort of uh, uh, developmental events, a lot of different uh, potential uh, uh, compounds. And then we finally looked at uh, uh, focusing on what are the conserved signaling pathways during development. There was a paper, or excuse me, a report that was put out by the NRC that uh, honed in on and identified 17 different uh, signaling pathways that are conserved during early development across a wide range of species. And so we took those 17 pathways and organized them according to uh, different sort of stages of early development, and that's what I'm showing you here. So what's shown in kind of black are, are where you have greater emphasis of those particular signaling pathways within that particular uh, stage of development. And so we could then utilize those conserved signaling pathways um, as a way to identify, also identify potential um, assays that would capture key events that not only are relevant to early life stages of fish, but also relevant to uh, a wide variety of species, including humans. And so we could then identify and fill gaps with additional data, either using assays that uh, capture these sort of conserved signaling pathways, but also using that in combination with some high content assays using zebrafish embryos and, um, and, uh, and so on. So we then, uh, finally, we ended up identifying um, some short-term and long-term research strategies. So this was uh, relative to 2014 when we published this. And so our short-term sort of research strategies were to, uh, within the next, within three to five years, were to expand and disseminate a conceptual model of normal fish development, so expanding that um, conceptual model that I showed you earlier identifying sort of low-hanging fruit based on toxicological relevance and immediate regulatory needs, uh, optimizing targeted assays for these high priorities, uh, FAOPs, and then also looking at uh, characterizing uh, biotransformation of fish embryos, which is important because uh, often fish embryos uh, for some compounds lack the ability to, uh, to metabolize um, uh, parent chemicals into uh, 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 potent metabolites such as chlorpyrifos. And then our long-term uh, strategies or goals over the next five to 10 years were to optimize uh, targeted assays for lower priority AOPs as well as uh, move toward developing quantitative AOPs where you have dose response curves within each of the sort of boxes that allows you then to predict quantitatively uh, um, at higher, higher levels of biological organization. So finally, I just wanted to highlight, uh, before I wrap up, highlight a couple different RFPs that uh, were directly a result of the uh, HESI-sponsored uh, uh, workshops and efforts that we uh, uh, did uh, uh, nearly 10 years ago. And so the first was a RFP that came out of the Long Range uh, Research Initiative, which is part of um, the CEFIC organization, which is is uh, represents the European chemical companies uh, in Europe. And this was a, an RP that was specifically focused on the development of an alternative testing strategy for the fish early life stage test. And this was uh, an RP that again, directly came out of our efforts uh, within this HESI committee. Um, the PI that ended up being funded through this uh, RP uh, was Dries Knoppen, who's at the University of Antwerp, and, um, and he received an initial round of funding from 2013 to 2016, and then some follow-up uh, funding from 2016 to 2018, and, uh, and his group uh, did a fantastic job on, on, uh, on this project. They ended up uh, producing about 15 peer-reviewed papers. A lot of it was focused on using uh, thyroid sort of disruption as, as kind of a case study, and you can find more information about, um, about their findings and kind of an overview of their project uh, at the link below. 
The second RFP that I wanted to highlight uh, was out of the US EPA, and this was a recent RFP that opened up in 2018 and was recently uh, announced about a month, uh, month and a half ago uh, for that uh, five organizations, five universities ended up being funded. University of Riverside, or University of California Riverside was one of them, uh, but our project was focused more on human embryonic stem cells. But as part of this uh, RFP, there was also a focus not only on human uh, identifying alternative assays for uh, mammalian toxicity, but also identifying uh, alternative assays on the eco side. And the text I'm showing you at, at the bottom here is just is from the RFP. And again, it's highlighting how some of our work within uh, this HESI committee ended up contributing or leading to um, the call for additional research within the context of this particular RFP. And in addition, the uh, Evelyn uh, Stinkins, who's, uh, who's kind of highlighted also in this paragraph, she was a, a PhD student within Dries, uh, Dries Lab, and she ended up taking the lead on the CEFIC funded project that, again, is highlighted uh, within this RFP. And so um, the, the PI that ended up uh, being funded to look at uh, developing alternatives for on the eco side was Suzanne Brander at uh, Oregon State University. And her project's gonna look at uh, basically developing alternatives for uh, fish early life stage testing within a urihaline uh, fish, uh, specifically Manidia. And so, um, yeah, so that that's all I had uh, for you. I just uh, wanted to end off, again, highlighting how our efforts nearly a decade ago led to uh, the introduction or development of a couple RFPs, which will hopefully down the road continue to move the needle uh, a bit more uh, on fish early life stage testing and identifying alternatives. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, David. Um, I really enjoyed that. It's a nice kind of um, setup for, you know, more progress that's happening um, right now and more research. So great example. Um, we again, remember to add your questions to the question box uh, and I'll, I'll read them out as they come in. I have a couple uh, really, I think more, more comments, but we'll, um, we'll read them off. Um, one of them is the OECD threshold approach is certainly a good idea. However, it doesn't stipulate which algal EC3, EC50 value to apply biomass or growth rate. And it says that this is sometimes misinterpreted by P CROs, potentially leading to lower PNAC values. Um, and maybe could use another look at, uh, at that approach or the guidance around that approach. I don't know, um, Michelle, if you had any reaction to that. Uh, no reaction, I, I think, is a good point. I think it's something that as we begin, I think especially when we <clears throat> look at some of the new methods being developed, taking a little bit of a broader look at how they how they fit together and are there existing approaches that would benefit from some refinements, whether that's a refinement mm -hmm. to the guidance document or whatever that might look like. So mm -hmm. it's a point's well taken. Okay. Anyone who works with OECD, you can... Uh, <laughs> propose that as something to add to the work plan down the road, potentially. Great. Um, one other question is, or comment is, validation of CARP S9 will be useful for the 319 A and B. Um, and there says there are some efforts ongoing. I don't know if you um, have heard of those. Yeah, so we actually, the bioaccumulation committee that has been working on that in vitro method, we had a pretty large workshop intense workshop, I guess you could say, in Washington in early November and, or early October, sorry. And we talked a lot about some of the needs in that space, one of which was looking at other species, particularly species important in other regions of the world, and CARP was one of the ones that came up. So uh, I know there, are, there is ongoing work in that space, and I'm trying to get in touch with people working in that space. So if the person who asked the question, uh, would like to get in touch with me, it would be great to connect if, if you're working on CARP. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, I can connect you guys. Um, another 
question. Uh, as you highlighted, Michelle, in one of your first slides, environmental risk assessment requ requires the protection of all species on a population level. So are there efforts concerning transferability to other species? Um, and the, applying this question both to cell line and fish embryo testing. I don't know uh, if it, maybe it's other fish, but also, you know, non aquatic species. Because yeah. you take the question in the different direction. Well, there's a lot potentially in there. I mean, I think related to some of the new methods, and this came up actually at that bioaccumulation workshop, is so right now that S9 and hepatocyte method, I'll just take that one because I'm most familiar with that. Um, it's it's written for rainbow trout, but obviously we know as with other OECD test guidelines, there's the potential to look at other, let's just say, just look within fish at other species of fish. So if you just look within that, that taxonomic group understanding basic differences in, uh, and in this case, we were looking at metabolism. So what do we know about the baseline metabolism of fish? Um, the variability of um, ability to, to metabolize compounds across different fish species, you know, if you look at their phylogenetic uh, sort of organization there. And then that the bioaccumulation committee, as I mentioned really quickly, we're really interested in looking at invertebrates and birds as well. So if you just look at the, the concept of metabolism, just even on its own, just getting a basic understanding of general differences and capacity to biotransform chemicals across the different taxa is, is one piece of the puzzle that's really fundamental to kind of our understanding to try to get at that question of how do we protect a population. So a lot of the work that's really needed in this space is, um, you know, you, you could always sort of fall into this, let's test in more species and more species, but to try to get some fundamental basic understanding of what we know about the, the species that we're trying to protect and the species that are commonly tested um, and, and do it pretty strategically. Uh, and, and I think one of the fundamental problems is that kind of research isn't always the most exciting research to fund. We talked a lot about things like basic physiological parameters, um, understanding of the, you know, the, um, the genes and proteins and enzymatic functionality across species. Uh, and things like that are really needed. So, all that to say, I think there is an effort to try to expand some of these methods, um, but we're still in that space of trying to get some of the fundamental understanding first before we can go too broad with some of it. But there's a lot of work in the fish embryo space to look at other species. Um, obviously, developmental windows are pretty different across some of the different fish, so that's pretty important as well. But there, there's definitely an eye towards the fact that we realize that these tests can't can't be one size fits all for all ecological species. So expanding them is on the radar for sure. Does yeah, I know that, yeah, yeah, definitely. I think that's the right um, way of thinking about it. I, I know that someone in um, Duluth a couple of years ago, Carly Lalone in Duluth EPA was working on a tool and I can't remember it's the Zika name Pass. of it, but it just, yes, <laughs> that's what I was trying to think of. And I, my understanding is that's was part of that tool was trying to um, look across species at some of the differences that might be important for for toxicity. Yeah, and that's a really great tool. I would, um, if you haven't heard of it, and I don't know, maybe this group would be interested in doing a webinar on that. I think it's it's really mm -hmm. great. It was highlighted highlighted at CTAC in an interactive session last week, um, and I think things like that are really fundamental to 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 getting at some of the questions that we have. Um, but a lot of times the those sort of, again, that fundamental understanding um, doesn't always get as much research funding as some of the other things. Mm -hmm. So there's my little plug. <laughs> I don't know, Dave, if you have any thoughts on that one. Yeah, I think, I mean, at, at least as it relates to fish, I mean, this is, this is also a good reason, you know, to focus on fish early life stages because as, as you mentioned, Michelle, even though the timing of the developmental landmarks is different, uh, depending on what, you know, fish species you're talking about, essentially a lot of the developmental landmarks are, are very similar, right, mm -hmm. across different species of fish embryos. I mean, we're using zebrafish embryos as a model for human health, right, because, I mean, some of the developmental landmarks 
and and a lot of the signaling pathways that happen within a really early you know really early uh, embryo is even similar to a human right and so um, so I don't think it's a big stretch to uh, to begin extrapolating to other fish species whether it's through CECAPAS or some other tool uh, because particularly during very early development a lot of these stages are going to be highly conserved. I mean, again, the timing that it, you know, the timing that these uh, uh, stages happen is is variable across the species. But essentially, the you know the 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 set of developmental landmarks is very similar. We have another question. Um... To what extent are existing mode of action data from mammalian toxicology studies being incorporated into developing AOPs for fish? I mean, I'll take that one. Um, I'm, yeah, I don't know. That's a great question. I mean, and that's kind of what we were thinking uh, within the 2011 paper is that particularly for the tier one assays, um, you know, I, it wouldn't necessarily make sense to develop a bunch of like fish specific cell lines or fish specific, you know, I mean, there's a lot of tier one type assays already available uh, through ToxCast and other programs. So why not, you know, why not leverage those as a way to help prioritize uh, FELS testing? So um, yeah, I completely agree. I think, I mean, there's uh, an opportunity there to to use assays that already exist rather than spending another 10 years developing new assays that are fish specific, but you know, to what extent that's being done uh, for sort of testing this idea out in terms of FELS testing, I'm not, I'm not sure. Michelle. Yeah, I don't know specific to FELS testing. I do know that if you, um, the AOP wiki, uh, which you can get to at aopwiki.org um, hosted by Society for Eversocken Pathways and, and OECD. So that is intended to fill, to allow some of this cross-pollination. Um, some AOPs are species specific and others are not, and others are sort of, they just have the species specific details, but then apply generally where they can. Um, I think it really just depends on the specific mechanisms and how those of those each apply to the different species and and really obviously very much dependent on the data that we have to be able to speak to that um yeah i think i mean I, th I think the risk of the, the only potential risk of um in, of utilizing mammalian specific uh like tier one assays as a way to prioritize for fels is that you know in you know, in some cases, it might be a good predictor. So, for example, if you had like an agonist for the AHR, right? We know that TCDD is a potent agonist for mammalian AHR as well as fish AHR, right? So that would be pretty good concordance. But if you look at like, for example, we've been doing some work with some PPAR gamma agonists and uh, and utilizing reference compounds that are known PPAR gamma agonists in mammals. And, and what we and others have found is that actually, if you take a reference PPAR gamma agonist, uh, such as ciglitazone, um, even though it's a potent PPAR gamma agonist uh, for humans, it's basically inactive, more or less, as well as other PPAR gamma agonists uh, when you look at fish, zebrafish specific PPAR gamma. And so in that case, you know, it would, it would be potentially a, a false uh, positive you know, if you if you screen, you know, compounds that were suspected to be PPAR gamma agonists using a mammalian <clears throat> specific tier one assay. So, I mean, it's not going to, it wouldn't be perfect, of course, uh, and there would be, you know, some false positives and false negatives. But I think by, you know, the bigger the, 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 bigger the battery is, um, then you could rely on sort of a weight of evidence approach, uh, depending on how many hits you have uh, that represent a particular sort of key event before you decide to move into the next tier. So 
I, I can just add to that. I mean, Christy, I was going to mention the AOP wiki because I think that that's one place where there's various people working to put in pathways that are some of which, like you said, are fish specific, some of which are mammalian specific, some of which cut across. And I think that the idea of not relying on a single key event, but multiple key events and seeing where you may have concordance across mammal and fish, for example, and where you have a divergence or maybe you have, you know, common early key events, but then that diverges later to different apical effects. So um, I think there's some pathways that we know are pretty highly conserved where there's various groups putting information in the wiki. And once I think we get more pathways populated, going across and looking like where do we have sort of mammalian fish crossover, I think that'll be easier to do down the road. So I think that's a good place to go. Yeah, I agree. I think that thyroid is one example where there's been a, a lot of work um, by uh, Dan Villeneuve and lots of others to understand, you know, what thyroid related mechanisms are relevant for which species and create this sort of network um, mm -hmm. to be able to start screening and understanding what goes where. And the H receptor is another one where there's quite a few pathways and I don't know, you know, again, how much has been done to sort of bring some of those together, but that's another one where it'll be interesting to take a look and I'm sure there's a handful of others too. Yeah, great questions. Um, we don't have any more questions coming through, so I think we'll go ahead and end. I. Amy and I both really appreciate uh, David and Michelle for giving these presentations. And uh, thanks all of you for listening. Remember that uh, the slides are available on the website on the address that you see on your screen there. And please feel free to email Amy or I or um, uh, access the slides as you wish. Thanks again. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Thanks.